For years, I've gotten to see Pat Mackin run his hit and miss engine, a fairly large 22 horsepower Fairbanks Morse, and various meets. But for the first time ever, we got to record the entire process. Hope you enjoy. down the road and all of a sudden this rattle develops. Yeah. What the heck is that? Okay, so we've got this little engine. What are you doing with the little engine, Pat? Okay, the little engine I use for compressing air to start the big engine. So effectively, it's a starting engine for the big engine. And it hasn't run in almost a year at this point, so I'm going around lubricating things, making things are sure things are free, uh, nothing is rusted up, uh, just going over it and servicing it, getting it ready to run. And right now I'm oiling the valves. Uh, a lot of oil points on it, all the governor, the push rod, the magneto drive, that's adjusting the carburetor, putting the hand crank on it, and going back and remembering to check the valves to make sure they're not stuck. Just bump them with the hand crank and attempting to start it. And as usual, it fires a few times and quits. and. You end up playing with things and adjusting. There is no adjustable choke. This is when I realize that the crankshaft where the hand crank goes on is dry, so we put some oil on it and spin the crank so that it, the crank doesn't bite me when it starts. And again, cranking and playing with and It hasn't run in almost a year at this point, so it takes a little doing to sometimes to get it to run. Sometimes, especially with a crowd or being filmed. It becomes recalcitrant. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, many times it will start and run the first try. This is relieving the outlet on the compressor so that you're not pumping against head pressure until the engine warms up. And adjusting the drip oiler on the piston. And having it quit again. How much pressure do you have to get in the tanks to start the big one? It will start on about 35 pounds. I usually have the relief on it set up about 60. Like I say, sometimes it will take off and run the first time you want to try it, and other times it just doesn't quite want to. Yeah, it's probably shy in the crowd. Yes, they tend to be that way. You can work on them at home, and typically they will start the first spin every time and go to the show and spend half a day making them run. Now, you store this rig out in front of your house most of the year, right? No, this one sits behind my house. Oh, this one sits behind the house. Okay. No, this one does not sit on the street. It has occasionally, but normally it sits out back. But it does sit outside. Which in Prescott, Arizona, most of the time isn't a big deal. No. no the large engine sat outside down at Wickenburg from, well, built in 1899 until I took it out of there in the early 90s, and so it's always sat outside. 
and here we're discussing and fellows that want to learn something about it and trying to teach them a few things going on about it. And I'm going around with oil can in hand. The oil, well to do the, the first oiling on the uh, piston, the wrist pin, the main bearings, the camshaft, the rod bearing, the main bearings are, there's a small oil cup with a reservoir or a tube in it that I have uh, wool in, wool fibers spun into a, like a string or a rope, and it wicks the oil up the, the wool and then drips it on the crankshaft and the camshaft on the bearings. So it's got a continuous oil feed while it's running. There's a drip oiler that does the rod bearing and the one on top that you see lubricates the piston and wrist pin. And I'm handing the oil can off to Ethan and he's going to do the things on his side including the governor and all the linkage for it and making sure that everything is free and lubricated. How long can it run on one lubrication? Is it like every couple hours? A day? It'll run at this speed and load it'll run all day. Okay. Usually I go around and check things mid-afternoon or early afternoon and give some of the, the freestanding things another drink of oil but the bearings and all are usually good all day. So and there's a lot of points to oil on this engine on all the old engines. And so Ethan's the guy on the far side. Right? Yes. Yeah. And he's expressed an interest over the last few years of wanting to know how to run it and how to operate it. And so we're going through ongoing training. And then we need to turn it so he can get to the other parts of the governor on the other side. Phil in the foreground is opening the valve on the little whistle on top that I use for a compression release, okay. making it easier to turn. At least you don't have to start it like some of the old tractors. You have to use the flywheel as the method of starting. Well, that is a recommended procedure. The recommended that they say they used on the test floor in the plant was they spun the engine, they brought it up against compression, normal rotation, mm -hmm. and then got everything set and primed and spun the flywheels backwards. So it bounced against compression, tripped the ignition, fired, and kicked it and it ran forward. Wow. Which works very well, but with it on the truck, you can't see everyone to make sure everyone is in the clear and safe. Okay. And it's just not a safe procedure. We have done that one time, hmm. just to see if we could. And the museum I'm involved in in California, we have a tractor with basically the same engine in, in it. And we started that one that way for years. In fact, okay. that's the way we still start it, is to spin it backwards. Yeah, I've watched Advanced Rumley start it that way. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the Rumleys, they just walk them through, walk in the flywheels and spin them over. And to me, that's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. And like I say, there's a lot of places to be oiled. And while Ethan is learning, we're taking our time. What type of oil does it take? Just about anything. I don't like the synthetics. It tends to drain off too much when it's not running. Hmm. But any conventional oil, figure anything that we've got today is a thousand times better than what they had a hundred years ago, yeah. or in this case, a hundred and twenty years ago. And we're parking it, getting ready to start it at this point. We start it with the piston just past top dead center, starting down on the firing stroke. 
or on the power stroke, actually. What do you run for fuel in it? The gasoline from the truck. At this point, I'm, I've got a safety switch inside the cab in the ignition circuit. So I go up there and turn that one on and check to make sure that the igniter is working and everything around the back. And right in front of you are the air tanks that you're storing the air for turning. Right. Exactly. The small engine and compressor puts air in the tanks. And then there's the valve on the side of the end, the check valve up on the cylinder. And a hand valve to regulate things. And at this point I'm checking to make sure the points on the igniter, the low tension ignition are working. I close the switch and operate the igniter manually and, and ground across the contacts with my pocket knife to make sure I've got spark when I should. Kind of a crude way of doing it, but effective. Mm -hmm. And at this point, Ethan is around on the other side manually operating the fuel pump. I open the drain on the carburetor and drain a small amount of gas out of it as he's pumping it. Close that valve and I open the valve on the fuel return line. There's no float in the carburetor. It's an overflow system. So it comes up to a preset level and then drains back to the tank. And I get a little gas out of that valve. Then we know the fuel system is ready and that gives me some priming gas to actually start the engine with. And Ethan is, let's see, probably putting, there's a cutter pin that operates a sliding mechanism to allow you to hand pump things. And I'm going around to check and make sure he got the cotter pin in the right place, and he didn't. One of those things you learn after many years of doing this. So once you get the cotter pin put back in, then you put a little more oil in the cup on the fuel pump. It's just a brass piston and a brass sleeve with some packing on it to seal it and check valves. Very basic fuel system. Any idea how much fuel it uses under load? Uh, not really. Running like this, it'll use about three gallons a day. Hmm. There, he, he squirted some oil on the fuel pump packing. And you might note the coffee pot up on the exhaust valve chest, and there was a little tin plate up there on all the engines at this mine, and we couldn't figure out what it was for at the for a long time and I finally decided that that's where the coffee pot sat and kept your, the operator's coffee hot all day. Which is probably just what they did. Yes. And here we're oiling the igniter and the intake valve and just checking everything one last time. And there's a primer cup on the fuel system on the side that I'm on and I just primed it, the little primer cup, with three cups of gasoline in it. The little cups holds a little more than a thimble full of gas. Okay. And I fill that three times and let it run down the pipe so that when I turn on the air, it blows an air-fuel mixture into the cylinder mm -hmm. for starting. Well, when something is a start off, the priming cup sure make it nicer. Oh, yes. Well, that way it starts the first try. Mm -hmm. Checking the exact position of the piston and flywheels, walking around looking at everything, making sure the igniter is set, closing the ignition switch. The switch is a bit of overkill, but I can see it from anywhere around the engine and make sure it's off. It's safe to work on. And when I'm ready, I simply open the valve. It blows an air-fuel mixture into the cylinder. 
starts the piston moving, that trips the ignition, it fires, and it starts. And I start it with the choke closed, so after it fires once, I take the choke partially off, close the check valve on the air system so that the valve isn't bouncing against the seat, and let it fire a few times and start opening the choke, and at this point in time, we're running. And this engine was originally used for pumping water in a mine. It pumped water out of a gold mine. It pumped water up about 400 feet to the surface. And uh, tell me a little story about how you got the engine. Uh, we were at a county fair years ago with some small engines. And a man that had a local sawmill stopped to talk to us and said he knew where there were some big ones. So a few weeks later we rode down and looked and everything was still sitting right where he said it was, but it had signs on it, all old equipment, property, Wickenburg Museum. And we figured, well, we've been beat out of it. Somebody got there before we did. And a few weeks later, uh, a friend of mine and I, actually the fellow who got me into this, were talking about it. And he picked up the phone, called information for the Wickenburg Museum, called and asked for the director. And the man said, I'm the director. And Harry, and I don't remember his last name. And they talked, and Keith made comment that we really liked the engines and we'd like to have some big ones. And he said, okay. And we didn't know what to do with that to start with, so we made a deal to haul two okay, engines for them, you. an air compressor, and some other equipment to Wickenburg and help them with it. We got one donated for Charlotte Hall Museum, and the three of us involved each got an old engine. Which is a pretty cool deal. Yes, and it took us several years because hauling it out of there turned out to be a real adventure because all we had at the time were pickups and car trailers. I ended up building a big three-axle equipment trailer mainly for this project and eventually building up a 51 Chevy ton and a half for this project. And this engine, you said, how much do you think that weighs roughly? It weighs roughly 6,000 pounds. Now, pickups wouldn't cut it. <laughs> well, at points, we had three pickups chained together to get up some of the hills coming out of the mine. Wow. We broke the axle on one car trailer twice coming home, and it was a real adventure. Can you say how much is this thing pumping about a minute? It pumps roughly 500 gallons a minute. That was quite, quite the machine. And the whole truck and engine weighs approximately 13,000 pounds. All right, well, it's it's really cool. I was so glad that we got to find out exactly how this is done. <laughs> well, it's good to share it. This is Trish from Cars Plus. I'd like to offer special thanks to Pat Mackin for allowing David Spence to interview him about this amazing machine. This video recording took place at the Prescott Antique Auto Club Annual Car Show Swap Meet and Old Engine Fire Up. Like and subscribe if you like old engines and are a car enthusiast like we are.